All right, we are uh, almost ready to roll. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the way we are going to do is first, uh, uh, Simon, uh, somebody else joining you as well, or you are, will be presenting? Yeah, actually, Rachel uh, Hagel is going to join for okay, okay. jumping in the last, last portion of the presentation. So Okay, so I should, uh, once you are done, who will go first, Rachel, or you? I'll, I'll go first, and I can even just uh, keep control through the whole presentation and okay. just uh, just kind of move through the slides. So, Rachel, what uh, I have to allow her to, when she's ready, just alert me, and I will... Uh, uh, give her the permission to share. Okay. All right, so first uh, Simon will go and then uh, uh, Debbie will join us. Uh, Debbie has been, uh, uh, she'll be talking about <laughs> trials and tribulation of uh, Facebook and she's back now. Then uh, I'll show some slide from uh, our good friend, Michael is enjoying the Islands hockey game. So, he said he got some tickets and uh, I said, you choose your priority. So he, he, he will be enjoying the hockey game. So I'll share a few of his slides, what's going on there. And then uh, I'll be going through very good slides. A lot of questions are coming in on variety of topic, diagnostic diseases. And then towards the end, uh, we'll uh, have a forum open on uh, Pricing. So that is the plan. All right. Uh, as you know, this is being recorded and we have a dedicated YouTube channel as well. Last uh, three uh, talks have been, um, they are there now. This will be the fourth one. Then we'll be adding the betting plus one as well. So that'll be a good link for uh, you to having if you want to go through later on. All right, Simon, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Mirza. Um, yeah, and I guess thanks everyone for, for joining today. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to opportunity to tell you a little bit more. If you're not already, already familiar with TerraLink, um, introduce you to TerraLink. And if you are, um, maybe introduce you to some new products that we're offering. Um, so yeah, I guess brief, brief introduction to TerraLink. Um, TerraLink's privately owned, 100% Canadian company. So we started back in 1973 um, as a fertilizer supplier for Fraser Valley Dairy, Vegetable and Berry Farms under the name of Coast Agri Crop Supplies. And yeah, we've really expanded a lot in the last, um, I guess, 40 years now. And we like to think that we are, I guess, a one-stop outlet for growers of all types. So we work with forage, fruit, um, vegetable, turf, ornamental, and of course, uh, greenhouse. So this slide is a few examples of some of our key partners, um, many of which um, you might recognize and would be leaders globally in crop input manufacturing. So it's just, just a few examples. Um, yeah, so, TerraLink really specializes in uh, manufacturing and distribution of granular, liquid, and water-soluble fertilizers. Um, our wide range of products and services really reflect our mission to remain the agronomic leader in assisting like growers, producers to maximize their profitability um, of their businesses. So. This is uh, a few examples here of some of our TerraLink brands. Um, you might recognize these from um, garden center shelves. So these would be kind of custom packed, um, small pack fertilizers for resale in a garden center type um, environment. Um, and I wanted to introduce you and talk about a few um, product examples from BioFert. So BioFert is our organic subsidiary. So um, certified organic inputs. Um, we manufacture at our facility in Chilliwack. Um, so yeah, this would be kind of tailor-made for 
like I said, certified organic growers, whether you're OMRI or EcoCert, um, but it really allows uh, TerraLink to offer these organic inputs uh, under the TerraLink umbrella. So it's not necessarily only for certified organic growers. Um, it really could be for anyone looking to introduce um, more earth-friendly, sustainable uh, inputs into their fertigation practices. Um, so before I talk about specific products, um, I want to mention Earthlink. So, so Earthlink is kind of a hybrid. It's, it's a new program uh, from TerraLink. So Earthlink is a brand that is, um, should be of interest, I think, to any growers who are looking to make that transition into a more sustainable um, type uh, program. So, um, but, you know, maybe aren't necessarily uh, looking to become a fully certified organic facility. Um, so yeah, the idea here is to introduce a lot of these rich natural compounds that are found in a natural uh, soil ecosystem um, while still delivering the maximum benefits of synthetic fertilizers. So there are, from my perspective, kind of a wide ranging um, variety of different um, like benefits that you can see from using organic inputs. So this can be in assisting nutrient uptake, um, drought stress tolerance, um, you know, hot Alberta summers, obviously, uh, yeah, things can get warm. Sometimes you can have drippers uh, go out on you and having some kind of plants, boosting the plants natural tolerance for handling stress is a nice way of kind of mitigating those, those issues. Um, seed germination is, is a nice benefit as well. And I'm going to introduce just a few examples of some Earthlink products that kind of help with some of these benefits. Um, so the three I want to highlight are e ELC Green, uh, Affinity, and a new product that we have just kind of finished uh, the research and development phase. Uh, we're really excited about, uh, it's a 1044. It's called the Earthlink Green series. Um, so Sea Green, uh, just gonna, I'll run through it really quickly. Um, you can see you've got some information on the screen here as well, but organic based, like all the Earthlink products, uh, high potassium liquids, uh, these are all liquids. Um, main ingredient here is Acadian sea kelp. Um, so sea kelp, a lot of growers, I think, don't use it and maybe they don't appreciate the, the potential benefits, um, but sea kelp contains over 70 micronutrients and it can really help with um, promoting foliage and blooms, um, enlarging plant chloroplasts, as well as optimizing cell processes. So it's just a really strong biostimulant. And um, from what we see, um, it's beneficial in a wide range of different crop production scenarios. So second one is a product called Affinity. And this is a mix of uh, organic carbon, uh, humic and fulvic, as well as a natural wetting agent called yucca. Uh, and yeah, really just helps with rooting. This the whole theme here, I guess, is, is, is improving uh, rooting um, in greenhouse hydroponic type environment. Um, and yeah, full, having a good fulvic component in your program is really helpful um, and can help with cation exchange capacity, um, enhance nutrient uptake, um, and free up some, some stuff that might be tied up maybe in your medium. Um, so this is a photo of the new 1044, um, which is kind of specifically designed for bedding plant growers. Um, it has the micronutrient content there needed for most, if not all bedding plants. Um, you can see it's got a nice green color from the iron. Um, there's no dyes or anything added to the product. Um, so here's a little bit of a breakdown here on the bottom of the screen of the micro and macronutrient content of this liquid fertilizer. So it's, it's really similar, I guess, to um, like a nature source type product. So concentrated liquid, um, 
just really easy to work with, kind of an all-in-one uh, product. It, you might need a little bit more calcium um, depending on your media calcium levels, um, in which case, you know, you can look at adding some calcium nitrate at, you know, in a, on a per basis type type situation, but really it's, it's a one size fits all product for bedding plants. And we're really excited to launch this one. We did a bit of a trial earlier this year um, in the Edmonton area. So this was up at Wallace greenhouses. You can see, um, essentially we just did a kind of a direct comparison of nature source versus our uh, 1043. It was a 1043 at the time. You've since uh, upgraded that potassium percentage by 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 one to make it a 1044. But uh, this same idea here, you can see these calbrocoas, um, really no difference in in um, crop health, um, and obviously rooting is is probably the most critical component for for a plant at this stage. And we were really happy with the results here. Um, and you can see in another example here, this is a side by side kind of at the end of that um, seeding propagation uh, period. And yeah, nice, nice healthy flowers, nice good green foliage on both sides. Um, so we were pretty, pretty pleased with the results here. And um, yeah, well, the, the, uh, the benefit to um, offering this product, I think in the, in the Western Canadian market is we're able to manufacture this product locally. So, um, we make this in, in Chilliwack and I think it can help kind of cut down on all the increased freight stuff that we're seeing right now, shipping stuff in from all over the place. So, and then um, just gonna run through a few Biofert products. So these ones are gonna be actually certified. So EcoCert, OMRI certified for cert certified organic facilities. Um, and these are also liquids, uh, concentrates, and really I chose kind of some just general kind of all crop types because I wasn't sure what kind of growers would be um, joining us today, but essentially um, this will provide most of your standard um, NPK requirements for most crops, um, suitable for greenhouse using a two or three um, EC level. Um, if you're, if you have something like a vegetable crop that has a uh, higher micronutrient requirement, we would suggest, um, adding the, um, general micros, essential micros product that I'll, I'll show you in a second here. This is another kind of all purpose organic fertilizer. This is, uh, it's called biofish. So it's a fish emulsion. Um, essentially, yeah, just a, a liquid concentrate that you would apply. We're trying to really, the, the odor has been one concern <laughs> growers have expressed. Uh, it, if, you know, if you're working kind of close quarters in a greenhouse, uh, you know, in the fer fertilizer room, it, it, the odor can be a little bit uh, too much, but yeah, they've been kind of working on ways to, to cut that back and, and make it a bit more of a hospitable environment for, for workers and employees. Um, yeah, um, this is the essential micros I mentioned. So just to kind of supplement, kind of boost up those micronutrients as needed on a kind of, uh, you know, depending on what crop you're, you're working with that might need a little bit extra uh, on that side of things. Um, yeah, again, all of these are made in Chilliwack um, at, by Biofert and distributed by TerraLink. Yes, Simon, there's a question. Uh, this new fertilizer you are talking about, do you have to supplement with CalMag like you do nature source or is it something you could use from transplant to finish? So we have designed it so that it is something you can use um, without supplementing. The issue yeah. is trying to, so I think, I think it's a, I think it's a 1% calcium in there and like I mentioned, it's still a fairly new product. So we are actually running some trials and I, I wanted to quickly mention those trials, uh, that we're, we're in the process of setting up. Um, but, uh, the, the challenge with the calcium component is if you put too much in solution, you can have issues with precipitation. Yeah. Um, so 
I think in most scenarios, it should be enough to get you through. Um, and we're still working on potentially trying to add more calcium without having that um, precipitation issue going forward. So I will have more information about the final, the final uh, iteration of the product once we finish these trials, probably at the end of April, May. Um, let's go back to that slide real quick, just for reference. Um, so yeah, it's got a it's got a decent uh, calcium component there, but I'm, I'm at this point we're we're still kind of in the final phases of the development process for this one. So kind of once we have a bit of a better idea, once we finish this trial, which we're um, which Dr. Mirza has been really kind of helping guide us through, um, facilitated by Lethbridge College at the Brooks uh, Research Greenhouse, um, we're essentially uh, going to be testing some of these. Um, organic uh, based fertilizers for some of these, um, you know, uh, drug stress tolerance, root to shoot, mass ratio, these sort of things. We've added 1043 to the trial just as another uh, side by side. So we should have some nice data kind of similar to this trial uh, I mentioned earlier for, at Wallish, um, but a bit more comprehensive. We're going to be running it on, I think, five or six different bedding plant varieties. Um, not just the caliber code. So we'll have some nice data, hopefully in about two months time to present. And that will be kind of coinciding with when we're going to be releasing that product um, yeah. commercially. So yeah, really excited for that. And one other question, will the ELSC green cause biofilm to build up in water lines that same as nature source does? That's a good question. So, and it actually may be really good timing because I was just about to introduce a product here to help with, with biofilm. Um, but, you know, there's a good chance it will because it is also um, uh, an, has an organic based component to it. And right. that's kind of where you see that, that biofilm buildup um, come from. And I think that's really kind of, you know, we see that even in, in, you know, entirely uh, synthetic conventional greenhouse type settings that biofilm is it's a fairly regular uh, issue and um, yeah so yeah I guess a good segue into this slide here this is a new product to Terralink um, you know, growers may already be familiar with uh, equivalent products in the market essentially it's a silver stabilized peroxide so we recommend and we're yeah, getting a lot of really good feedback from vegetable growers, from ornamental growers um, in a greenhouse setting. This is just a really nice way to keep that biofilm down, uh, applying this product. Uh, I think it's 40 ppm throughout the crop cycle just to keep that biofilm clear out of the lines. Um, yeah, so just a nice and and the benefits really go above and beyond biofilm removal. It's the obviously um, protecting your crop from disease pathogens is probably even more important um, than having clogged drippers, right? Just for root disease and allergy buildup, which can cause pests to come in the greenhouse and just a wide variety of, uh, you know, nasty stuff that can build up in in reservoirs in irrigation lines and in in crops throughout your crop cycle um so yeah this is, this is just one i thought i'd mention because we <clears throat> just kind of brought this online in alberta and we're now stocking this one in airdrie so just thought i'd mention that and i will transition over to rachel who's going to talk a bit she about has our... the, yeah she has the permission to do that so let's try excellent that. okay thank you yeah thank you everyone um, so that means then that I'm the one switching the slides. Is that correct? Or Simon, will you be? I can just, yeah, I can just slide through for you. If you want. Probably, probably easiest. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, yeah. So my name is Rachel Hagel. I work with Simon over at Terralink. Uh, I do specialize in the beneficial insect portfolio and wanted to bring a couple of really exciting, cool products to your attention today. Uh, first off here, we have the new and improved version of uh, Phytocereus persimilis, now available in sachets. And, you know, looking at the in info here, you might see this first section kind of focusing on the sachets. And it's a lot of the, the same benefits you would see with other type of slow-release breeder sachet systems, um, specifically that they're 
very quick and easy to put out, you know, don't require a lot of labor compared to a bulk tube product. Um, the sachets are pre-perforated, ready to go out right away. You eliminate any um, potential waste that would happen from the bulk product being knocked off the plants or you know, blown off um, as the sachet is obviously much more securely attached. And then another benefit of sachets in general is that you have a more precise application rate. There's less guesswork in, you know, compared to uh, the bulk mites, where you might have more at the beginning of the tube or more at the end of the tube type of thing. Uh, these are you know, an even distribution. So what makes this particularly special is that it's, this is a sachet system for persimilis. And persimilis has been in the market um, for decades already without much success in sachet format. So BioB, who is one of the leading producers of persimilis in the world, uh, has actually revolutionized the way that they produce the persimilis so that it can be collected. Um, traditionally, it's collected under starvation conditions. And in this format, they are actually collecting them when they're, they're fully fed, they're in, in good health, good shape that way. So this has several benefits, um, primarily being that they hold up better to transport when a creature is is collected under starvation conditions and then has to you know fly across the country to get to and be released um sometimes they're not in the best shape whereas these ones kind of come with with the meal already there so as soon as they come out of the bottle or the sachet it's available in both formats um, they have the ability to travel further to reach their prey they are more successful at actually capturing that prey because they're not uh, short on energy, they're well fed. And then there's actually uh, another benefit of increased fecundity, um, because typically the females would have to feed for possibly several days before they're able to actually have enough protein to, to lay their eggs. But in this case, they're able to start laying eggs immediately from day one, so you would get earlier establishment that way. And in this particular system, they're not only collecting adults, um, you would actually get bonus juvenile stages and eggs uh, in the product as well, both in the slow, slow release um, breeding system and just from the typical uh, bottle you might be more familiar with. And, oh yeah, the other point here, uh, proof of predation. So yeah, because they're not feeding uh, actually on spider mites in the lab where they're collected, they have more of a color like Swirsky or Cucumaris, kind of a, a pale brown, pale beige type color. And then once they're in the crop and they've located their target, the spider mites, and are feeding on those, you would actually see them change color to the more traditional reddish orange uh, shade that you'd be used to seeing. So you actually get proof that they're out there uh, doing the work and that they they found the spider mites you were intending they would find. So again, available both in the the new sachet format as well as the traditional bottle format. And yeah, it's, it's had great results so far um, with the growers I've, I've been working with who have used it. They've seen better establishment, stronger establishment, and earlier establishment in their crop uh, compared to the traditional version of Persimilis. And yeah, perfect. Um, so yeah, on to the other cool, exciting new product. Um, this one here is a supplemental food called Artemia. You may be familiar with supplemental foods for, for beneficial insects already. Uh, the idea being that they can either help sustain a population through periods of low pest pressure or if you're doing preventative application, um, but they have a, an added benefit of, again, kind of increasing the protein that that predator has access to allowing them to do their job better. So uh, in particular, this is a, a bit of a different product because it is based on uh, decapsulated brine shrimp eggs. So unlike uh, pollen, which can, which can actually uh, feed thrips as, as well as the dead guys or Festi eggs, um, which are sometimes used, this product is actually very good at standing up to greenhouse conditions like high humidity, high temperatures, high UV, uh, compared to those other products which actually start to break down very, very quickly in real world scenarios. Uh, these are quite tolerant and um, yeah, very resistant to break down through, through water and those other factors. So yeah, some of the kind of specific um, advantages here would be that the high protein food source, uh, similar to the, the persimilis I was talking about, uh, allows them to start a laying eggs uh, much more quickly than they would without that, that meal. 
It gives them the energy to travel further to reach their prey, to have more success actually hunting that prey. And um, as well, it can act as um, kind of like a, a first good meal for your younger generation. So, so the ones that are being established uh, from those adults that first come out uh, will actually have better success establishing in the greenhouse as well. And this product is also available in two formats. There's kind of a bulk loose application, as well as uh, the, one, the version pictured here is the Artemia feed line, uh, which actually has the food adhered along either edge, the top and the bottom there. Um, it's, it's not like sticky where you would have the uh, beneficial, say, being caught on there. It's just lightly adhered so they can easily uh, remove the food without being trapped themselves. And uh, similar to the sachets, this allows you to have more accuracy in the rate. You, it, it takes the guesswork out compared to a bulk product. You know that it's an even rate. It's very easy to see the product. Uh, I know it might not be easy in, in this photo, but in person, very easy to see the product on that line. And so you know uh, the rate it's being consumed at and when you would want to put out more. So, so very easy to monitor that way. And uh, it has a, another bonus um, similar to, to sachets where it actually minimizes any um, biological residue that you would be introducing into the crop. So I know with ornamentals, there it can be a higher concern about bran and the carrier that would, would come you know, with, with bulk mites or, or with a product like this. Uh, so having it in this more stable format means that you're not going to be shipping anything you didn't mean to ship along with your plants. And uh, similar with the, the waste reduction where you don't have any loose product that would be falling off of the plants. It's, it's very easy to keep it in place there. And just at the bottom, I'll, I'll draw your attention to the list of species that have been shown to benefit uh, in, in all the ways I mentioned, the increased fecundity, the easier establishment, the, the greater uh, distance they can cover. So many of the generalist mites, uh, your Swarovski and your Cucumaris, for example, uh, have been shown to benefit from this all the aureus species and some of the mirrored bugs. And they haven't added it to the tech sheet yet, but I did hear that uh, they've gotten great results with lacewing larvae on this supplemental food as well. Yeah, last slide for me here. Um, as, I, as I mentioned, we have some really cool, exciting uh, products out there that are fairly unique to us, not widely available, but we do also have solutions for all the, the typical things that, that you might need. So. Whatever your pest is, we, we have a solution for you and we'd be happy to uh, answer any questions or provide any more info uh, that might be helpful for you guys on any of the pests that you deal with. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Simon. Couple of quick questions. Are you there? I'm here. Uh, do you mix it with the, this fertilizer solution and put on the crop every? Every time you water? Uh, the 1044? Yep. Yeah, um, exactly. So in a hydroponic type setting, um, you would, you know, just dose it. Um, I believe uh, from memory, you know, EC is going to range depending on stage of the crop cycle, but, right, you know, right, yeah. Starting at about half EC up to one, 1.5. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, you can just dose it directly from, from the, um, the, the shuttle. Okay. Uh, is this standalone product or as well or using with the sea green? Sorry, I missed the first part of the question. Is it standalone on its or do you have to mix it using with the other fertilizer like your EL sea green? Yeah, so it would be standalone. Um, yeah, so something like a sea green would be more how we see it used. Anything with a sea kelp component would be more for um, rooting stage of the crop or during what, you know, if you see a, a forecast coming of really hot, dry weather, something like that, you'd want to get, get that sea kelp into the crop as a protectant, uh, preventative biostimulant. But yeah, the 1043 would be used standalone for nutritional needs, yeah. Is uh, intra hydro pure, uh, could be mixed with the fertilizer? Yes, so it can be mixed in your fertilizer stock tanks. Um, the only condition there is 
it can't be mixed in the same tank as you would have a chelated iron. Okay. Um, just because that, yeah, the interaction between those two chemistries can cause dissociation, reassociation. Um, but otherwise, to your, you're totally safe to, to uh, apply it to a stock tank for a large stock tank. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, appreciate okay. that. Uh, uh, you could sign, uh, stop sharing now. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Perfect. Mercer. Perfect. That's Thanks, really Rachel. appreciate that. Okay, Debbie, where are you? Yeah, I'm here, Marissa. Yeah, go ahead and share your trials, tribulations, successes. <laughs> um, yeah, okay. So I'm sure a bunch of you already saw a few emails go through. Um, over a month ago, I, um, <clears throat> I got totally locked out of my Facebook pages. So all the pages, the business page. And what happened is I had gotten hacked. Um, totally random. Like there, I had two factor authentication. I don't know how, how any of us could prevent that. Like, you know, I had super hard passwords and stuff. So, um, after doing some talking and explaining, I found out the same thing happened to Christy. So Christy Pollock from uh, High Prairie. And, um, so when you get locked out of Facebook, they ask you to send in government issued ID, like uh, like your driver's license has to have a picture of you on it so that they can, they can tell that you're a real person, not a robot. So I did that, she did that. It says it will take a day to review. And then um, she, she waited two months for her review and they completely deleted all of her accounts. So I had expected the same thing. It's been over a month for me and I got all my accounts back this morning, actually. So then what I did after I got all the accounts back is I immediately went to um, roles and permissions on my business page to add, um, to add like my daughter and a few people as administrators. That way, if I got locked out again, we could still access all the business pages from their cell phones and their accounts. So um, when I went to do that, there were five people on as admins that I can only guess were that were the people who hacked into it because they have no idea who they were. So I removed them quickly and then I um, I added, you know, a couple of people so that I have access again. Anyway, that's kind of the thing. I just assumed I was gonna lose it forever, but I did get it back this morning. So how did you handle the data? So I know you were in panic for some time that uh, all your data was on the Facebook and the customers. So how did you manage in between? Uh, uh, did you use, I think you did go to TikTok for some time. Yeah, yeah, I've been on TikTok for a while. Like as soon as TikTok came out, I, I uh, as soon as my kids started ticking, uh, started, um, talking about TikTok, I got a greenhouse um, account for the TikTok. Um, but so in while I've been kicked off Facebook, I've been doing TikTok and that's been going really well too. I'm getting followers on there. So I'm going to keep doing TikTok. I've had YouTube for a long time. I'm going to keep uploading um, videos to both of those places. Um, I learned a long time ago, and this is from Gary V. Does anyone watch Gary Varnachuk? He always says like, don't put all your eggs in one basket. You got to have lots of social media accounts. And so, you know, when one that looks like it's going to stick around for a while comes, I make an account for it and start posting things. And um, if I had completely lost my Facebook page, I wouldn't be able to access any of the live videos I did. So um, I have been filming videos and then uploading them to social media so that I own a hard copy um, because you, you just don't have that when you do a live on Facebook. You can download one, but the quality is kind of crappy. Yeah. So you are you are back on track now. You are happy. The, so what what is the advice for a, a grower who is not that uh, expert with Facebook and other media? So keep manual record. Keep a card of every customer as a backup. Or what do you think? Um, 
Yeah, I also have a really large email newsletter list. So I send out e-newsletters, well, whenever I feel like it, whenever I want to. And that, like, that is probably the, the best thing to have because you can always get a hold of your customers that way. Um, Facebook's, I mean, Facebook is, it's the easiest way. But if you have their email, um, a lot of places do a texting service now. I get texts from different companies and I always read them. Um, but people, you know, they don't always want to give out their cell phone number, but they'll sign up for an email newsletter, I think easier than they will give out their cell phone for a text service. So I think it just, it's good to have that collection. Um, we also did a mail out this year where we mailed our wish book that we made to a lot of people. So I also have like physical addresses where I could do a mail out again and just send something something out and then I have all the contact info for people that have ordered over the years but it's all those other me methods are slower uh what did Christy do for her followers now um so Christy had two accounts she had learn plant grow and she had Christy's gardens and greenhouses and on one of her Instagram accounts she had her husband as an admin and she is able to access that through his cell phone so um like what I would tell all of you to do is make sure you have someone or several people as administrators on your Instagram and your Facebook accounts so that at least if you get hacked, you can still access it through their accounts or they can post for you. So I put my daughter, my sister, and a couple other people on all of my accounts this morning as soon as I got access again. Yeah. It's not. I don't know if there's a perfect fix, but that's the only, that's the only thing Christy and I could figure out is that she could access one Instagram account just because her husband was the administrator, uh, an additional administrator on it. So how quickly you knew that uh, your account has been hacked instantly a day or a few days? Um, you get a, you get a notification instantly that like if you have two factor authentication, you know how when you type in your password, then it sends you a then it sends yeah, you yeah, code yeah, by yeah. your cell phone. So yeah. that's what happens when someone accesses your account that is suspicious. And it was in the middle of the night. So I didn't like I was asleep. I didn't see it till the morning. Um, but by then Facebook already shut it down because whoever hacked into it posted inappropriate photos. And it was disabled within a minute of hacking because you get emails and notifications about that. But then I lost it for over a month. And I was freaking out. Like, yeah. I'm like, for 12,000 followers, how am I going to, how am I going to tell these people that my Facebook page is disabled? Like I couldn't even do that. Yeah. And yeah. a new account and that got shut down too. So I don't, I don't know. I, yeah. I did not like it. Yeah, any question for Debbie from our participants? If not, Debbie, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And uh, I will now share first, uh, uh, Michael provided a few slides. Uh, so, <clears throat> I asked him that uh, he is going to go away for some time. So just uh, share a few slides so that I could uh, show to people. Okay, just a second. Okay, so Michael said that uh, still sticking lots of cutting. They are coming in. This is how on the left side they come in. They are... Uh, uh, in order, they are in the plastic bags and wrapped, and then this is how they look like. At one point, I always mentioned that if you are, you are, you are rooting unrooted cuttings, always watch that we have a very dry humidity. So if you take any unrooted cuttings here, uh, don't leave it too long here. And we did discuss that uh, it does soak it in water with a little bit of hydrogen peroxide let them float a little bit so that any external matter or shells of aphid, everything will become clear. So that's always a good, good, good precaution. So this is how, this how the package came in. Uh, then um, when they have rooted, they go 
here to tone up before shipping. So they are they're held down for some time and a little bit cooler temperature so that they could acclimatize it. So a little bit of fertilizer is given here as well so that they maintain their color. Then uh, plants of all kinds, we take our own citrus are cutting. So uh, some plants uh, Michael take his own cutting, a citrus is one of them. So this is a so-called insect repellent, uh, uh, the mosquito repellent plant which people use in beautiful citrus flavor on them. Automatic seeders are going all week, uh, trays are stacked when they go into the germination room. So pretty busy. You might have seen his germination room in which there is a mist and uh, darkness and some seed if they need light, they are some individual uh, areas there. Uh, we fill a lot of trays and water them before we use them anywhere. So they are prepared during the winter, ready to go with our orders. So that again, uh, you should ever visit Michael in uh, November, December, a lot of uh, uh, growing media is stored, ready to go. Our first crop of baskets, don't worry, you might be, uh, not be this big, but this is very, very early. So, so he has got uh, fairly advanced uh, hanging baskets as well. See you all next time. So that is, uh, uh, that's what uh, Michael said. And now I will share my screen and uh, all right, Greenhouse Chat. Uh, uh, what problems are coming in from growers? So that's I will talk with you. Few questions answered about PHEC and fertilizers, uh, diseases, and some early nutrient deficiencies. Oh, okay, this I've already done. Terry, Debbie Fizey, myself, and then Haiku have already done. Okay, this was a picture I shared with you on February 15th chat. This was uh, uh, the ornamental grass millet. It uh, looks like brown rod, pethium from this likely involved. So they cleaned up and I visited the greenhouse yesterday and uh, lo and behold, they look like this now March 27th. They did lose a few plants. Uh, one application of Roverol was done, which is a, a basal stem rot and gray mold, and then uh, 100 ppm nitrogen from complete fertilizer. They do use 5627 with calcium, so one or two application. So they did recover from uh, those plants. This was kind of interesting. Uh, this was delay in shipment. The the grower sent me this slide. Hi, Dr. Mirza. These just came in because they were delayed on a truck. What is the best way to handle them? Do we need to spray them with something? Should I keep them shaded? So a few questions the growers had in mind. So, so what do you see? I always have this approach. First, just assess the situation. Don't panic first, of course. Uh, you notice there, when, when I saw the picture, loss of green color, they look yellow. All the leaves are uniformly yellow now. There's no green color leaves left. They look like stretched to me. Uh, there was some leaf drop as well. Uh, there are possible mold as well, but uh, I couldn't see from the picture, but the grower mentioned there was some mold uh, growing uh, in between the plants. And there was no collapse of seedling like damping off. So in any situation, have an assessment first to sit down, write down some note that what are you dealing with? And then you evaluate, should I keep them or throw them? Uh, to decide on that question, an evaluation is required. A closer examination of any disease or insects. Check the roots, condition, and amount of roots. If I throw them, what are the options to get new plants? Uh, see if other growers have it sometime through the Greenhouse Forum. A lot of information does exchange. Take the loss, make a claim. It appears that uh, <laughs> the insurance company are already sending a claim form with the shipment. 
So fill the spaces with some other plants if that's possible. So you have to evaluate individually uh, how much damage has been done. Actions then, most of would like to try transplanting. So if roots are good, my advice is that uh, there's no serious damage, then it is worth a try. Uh, Michael and I shared some tips on the Greenhouse Forum as well. Uh, we did recommend a spray of protected fungicide, which is a copper-based uh, Phyton 27, uh, will be helpful. Uh, zero to all at 50 to 100 ppm can also be applied as well. Uh, remove any lower leaves which are dead or dying. After transplanting, keep them under shade. Bright spots are near the furnace. Don't, don't put them near the furnace because it's a very dry air and these plants will demand more water, which they cannot uptake. There's no photosynthesis. They're not making much food because of this yellow color on them. So, so some growers do use Wurzel dip from professional gardener company or some other, uh, other products which uh, other companies have, have got. This person was using uh, Wurzel dip. So growers design their own shading. I walked into this greenhouse. Uh, so the best way for them, their greenhouse are oriented east and west. So their south side, they, they are uh, standalone. So a lot of light was coming from the south side. So they decided to put a, and th this is a, not a shade cloth, but that is a frost protective cloth. So it does fit the white in color, but it does filter out light. So some plants were in, in that shade most of the time as the sun was moving. And they also put some shade cloth where my cursor is, mouse is, in the germination area so that there's no direct sunlight. So plants have germinated, so they want to avoid that drug. So that does help shade to the plants. Demand for water is less than, so plant could then balance itself out. Uh, one grower sent these pictures. Uh, geraniums cuttings arrived like this. Uh, you could see what condition they were. So basically damage during transit, a little bit of cold probably, they touched them right here on the edges. So pretty diligently she went through, took all the older leaves, etc. And then her questions were that, uh, uh, would you recommend planting these immediately or letting them rest for a few days to cover up and start new growth? The root looks good. We have tossed all product with rotten crowns, clean all mold and botrytis, isolated in cooler shaded location, applied hydroperoxide as I don't have any fungicide. So the grower already takes some good action. The circulating fans are running. So this, this was a good step there. So I'm not sure uh, how they're doing now, but um, the way they look like, uh, they, they should come out of it. And then this morning, uh, just came in today, uh, powdery mildew right on rosemary. Right this uh, white spot right here, and other leaves are showing as well. This is a fungus, uh, powdery mildew. Uh, before going to fungus, I know, the, know something should be known about this fungus. This is a disease of both low and high humidity. When it is the humidity is low, at that time in the greenhouse, it was about 26%. So under low humidity condition, this fungus produces more white spores. So if you notice that these white spots are expanding, that's an indication of low humidity. And this fungus is a truly uh, parasite in the sense that uh, very specific to each species. This fungus, powdery mildew on rosemary would not go to the other plants, subspecies are there. And then it needs live tissue. So for example, if you wash it off with water, then the spores will fall down on, in the growing media, they would not germinate. So they need a surface, leaf surface to grow in and germinate. And if the humidity is high, that then new infection will start. So if the spores have landed on a new leaf, it would not germinate until the, there's a moisture for about eight hours sitting there. 
So, so it, for this fungus resemble gray mold that it needs high humidity, but under dry condition, it really spread pretty fast. And right now, with the cold weather, the greenhouses are pretty, pretty dry right now. And uh, my recommendation always is that uh, start putting some water on the greenhouse floor as well so that you could build some humidity, monitor your humidity pretty closely. Body mildew is pretty, uh, Verbena, New Guinea, sometimes and begonia as well, but rosemary, they're good indicator plant that right away they will give you a warning that uh, body mildew is coming. Gerberas also, they like more nitrogen and also uh, body mildew loves high nitrogen situation. Verbenas could be devastating if you don't watch it early. So early so you have to be careful that there's a, enough warning by the time it's gone this far, you might try some chemicals, uh, but uh, because the such a white spot, the plant cannot manufacture its food, cannot do the photosynthesis. So as, as a result, there's not enough food to feed the roots to the shoot. So start monitoring very early. Uh, this uh, can come on the stems as well, that's gone too far. And of course, uh, the, later on, the leaves will start turning yellow. Petunias are also very susceptible to that. And these fungus spores look like this, you see, so under a microscope. So simple recommendation, add humidity by sprinkling water on floor. Uh, Make relative humidity in your greenhouse. Relationship between temperature and relative humidity for each one degree centigrade change in temperature the, the relative humidity change by 5%. So know the most susceptible plants, indicator, rosemary, and verbena are very, very sensitive. So one of the very uh, simple one is potassium carbonate, which you, you bicarbonate, which you use for pH, making it alkaline, about half a gram to one gram per liter. What it does is that uh, alkaline, if the alkaline solution, pH of eight, is sprayed on the surface of the leaf, the fungus, uh, the fungus spore cannot germinate. So that, that's how it works. And then uh, I always recommend add about one milliliter of horticultural oil. This is mostly for the bedding plants. For uh, cucumbers, this should be half a milliliter. Tomatoes are pretty sensitive. So you could use lower rate on them. Shake well and then spray. And uh, neem oil is also pretty good. Uh, uh, horticulture oil is pretty good. Copper-based fungicide, phyton, and other combination. Bordeaux mix, old one, pretty helpful. Sulfur is used mostly by cannabis growers and some larger growers as well. Sulfur burners are available. Zero tall is pretty good as well. And uh, generally, some of the growing media which uh, companies are marketing have silicon in them. Silicon in a fertilizer program is very beneficial for uh, already mildew control, especially with cucumbers and tomatoes. Um, I, I know most of the growers put as a hundred part per million of silicon dioxide as a regular part of the fertilizer program. Similarly, cannabis growers also use it fairly effectively to control already mildew. Then what is this on my begonia leaf? Uh, Michael uh, did send a <laughs> teaser to the people. I don't know how many guessed that, but uh, and did anybody able to guess it? Any comment from the listeners? Debbie, are you there? I'm here, but I don't know who it is. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's so quiet that I thought I'm the only one talking. Everybody's gone. <laughs> okay. So that's okay. Nobody's then. Yeah. All right. So look at the symptoms the begonia leaf, edges, these big spots here, black color surrounding them. So Michael and I agreed that uh, this is a gray mold botrytis. 
a very, uh, basically it's not a true pathogen. It is a opportunist fungus. When there is a damage on the crop and stress on the plant, this fungus will come, especially after pruning. It loves the injuries. A fungus you must know and learn about it. A disease of cold, clammy weather, uh, condensation and, and dew on leaves, eight hours of free water sitting on leaves, stem flowers to start infection, uh, multiplies very fast and produce billions of spores. So if you see gray spores, which I'll show you a picture, uh, don't try to clean it up, put in a gently in a plastic bag and then throw it. Otherwise, those spores will go into the air and start infecting others. Also, I have noticed that when hanging basket petals fall from the hanging baskets on leaves at the benches, uh, that provide a source of food, it gets a little bit sticky, and that's where this fungus uh, botrytis will come in. If you don't watch for it uh, later on, it's really devastating. You can unmark it was uh, very high humidity in this greenhouse. Uh, this is from last year, and uh, this is how it looks like uh, gray mold. That's why it's called. And all those small pinheads are uh, millions of spores are in those pinheads. So uh, you just shake it, and they will go into the air pretty quickly. Starting infection on geranium. This is where a pattern had fallen down from the top. It was sitting right here a little bit of condensation. So this is how it will start. And one of the easy way to confirm is that if you're not sure, if you take that begonia leaf I showed you, or uh, this one, uh, put in a plastic bag, seal it, and within a couple of days, you will notice brown fungus coming out of it. That's a positive test uh, for this fungus botrytis. Uh, this, this is very serious infection. All these pinheads are full of spores. Sometimes they will make a V-shaped pattern as well. And uh, this flower is too close, so it, it will also show botrytis uh, pretty quickly. Then uh, botrytis could also attack the base of the stem on the lower leaves like this. So uh, just be careful that uh, when you're, if, if the plots are too crowded, then this could happen very easily as well. Then botrytis could also attack uh, uh, begonias. Uh, this is one other picture. Then uh, botrytis canker. And this, this is the key to understand. If the water droplets sit like this, uh, on your leaves, then that's an invitation to the fungus botrytis. They will germinate right here, and then they will penetrate the tissue and start new infections. So gray mold is a disease of uh, high humidity and condensation. So air movement is very, very important for this one. Avoid overcrowding, proper spacing. So if the plants are too crowded, then um, this fungus could come uh, on the lower leaves because also seen that lower leaves get infected first, uh, very high humidity. The lower leaves will start decaying because there's not a flight due to overcrowding and that's where the fungus will start. Where do the spores come from? They are, they are in the air. They are only present, I call them. So uh, be careful with the watering. Uh, no late watering uh, so that at least two, three hours before sunset. So preferably good watering time is 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock uh, if you're hand watering it or basically if you're drip irrigating, then the chance is very less. And many fungicide registered uh, for use on this uh, fungus, but the first approach is air movement uh, and uh, proper spacing of the plants as well. Few questions on mixing fertilizer came in. Uh, from the new growers. I have a thousand liter tank. How should I mix fertilizers? Fill up to 900 liters of water, 
proper temperature, I still recommend that we should have a water temperature 18 to 20 degrees centigrade. Cold water, you know, four degrees centigrade is definitely no, no. I, I did some experiment when I was researching that uh, where people use the cold water and it did act as a growth regulator, but uh, it did delay the flowering on them. So you, you, if you wanted to try it, so what will happen is you knock them with cold water and then they take six to seven hours to come up uh, and then you knock them again. So poor plants were not happy at all. Uh, check the pH and EC. There's no need to adjust pH at that time, just check it. And add your NPK fertilizer, 5, 6, 27, 20, 10, 20, your nature source, your uh, 10, 4, 4, from Terralink, any fertilizer you want to use. For, for soluble fertilizer, you must dissolve the known amount uh, uh, in, a, in a 10 liter bucket in hot water, mix and pour into the tank, and then you got to mix it, you see, as well. Don't dump everything together, otherwise uh, they will precipitate out. Mix thoroughly, add calcium nitrate, dissolve in 10 liters in hot water, then pour in the 1,000 liter, and then mix and adjust the pH, and then that's the time to adjust the pH. Most of the time, many fertilizers which have got high ammonium nitrogen, will bring the pH down a little bit. So the best option is to adjust and calcium nitrate is slightly alkaline. So adjusting the pH at the end uh, uh, is recommended. And then when using injectors, a grower had five gallons bucket used for stock solution. And uh, five gallon, I always convert them into liters. It's easy to work part per million and grams per liter. So five gallon times 4.5 is 22.5 liters. So I took an example that she had some 20 to 10, 20. So, okay, 0 0.5 grams per liter. Injector ratio is one to 100. And so 22.5 liters will go through the injector and it will be diluted one liter into 10 liters of water. So one to 100 means that when the injector take up one liter of water, 100 liters have come through. So your one liter will be diluted into 100 liters. So total amount of water is 22.5 times 100, 2,250 2, liters of water. That's your total amount by the time this five gallon bucket is empty. So you will calculate rate is 0 0.5 grams per liter. So total is 0 0.5 times 2 to 5, so 11, 1125 grams, 1.12 kilogram, you will add into those five gallons and then one to 100. So some growers were confused with that. Uh, so when the rate is suggested, then uh, and if you want to use an injector, then this is how you will make your calculation. The stock tanks uh, always make sure that your NPK and magnesium and trace element are separate and calcium is the other one in the, in the stock tank. Rest in the diluted form, they could be mixed together. That also remind me, uh, one grower was using 20-20-20 and uh, it doesn't have any calcium in it. And this one had a very low magnesium. So make sure the fertilizer you have got uh, what is the numbers on them. So in this case, uh, she had to use 20-20-20 uh, plus magnesium sulfate plus calcium nitrate. So know what formulation you are using and what amendments uh, are. The trend is toward simplicity. That's why there were questions to Simon that uh, uh, everything is mixed together, but sometimes we have to add calcium because of our, that's our experience with nature so that Early in the season, we need some nitrogen, which is readily available, and calcium was a good choice there. And then I did manage to visit the greenhouse in the North Edmonton area. So very relaxing, uh, it was fun to see. Plants are coming up, uh, hanging baskets are getting ready. Uh, neat rows, proper labels on them. So they are just, uh, excited everybody, every 
Lino's girl is excited right now. I took some picture clothes here, hanging baskets. Uh, uh, it, it seemed like that the new growing media because uh, perlite was not there. So peat moss, a little bit of cracking here, but it was not serious. And look at the way the growing media is moving away from the edges. So, but when I checked it, uh, it was okay. So uh, don't let it prolong too long. Uh, so there must be some, uh, so something, yeah. So it, the surface is dry because of the low humidity, but there was enough moisture inside. Succulents were doing pretty good. They, they were in a good shape. And I love these begonias. They were uh, flowering already. Uh, I, I was reluctant to advise remove those flowers. I said, okay, just wash them. It's already end of March. So they're open. Greenhouse will be open in a few days. So leave it the way it is, but very nice and compact. And they were all nitrate, nitrogen. And this is what I like that they, a lot of these yellow sticky traps were there. So nothing was there. I did found a couple of fungus nests for there, but they might come later on. But monitoring those yellow streaky trap is an excellent idea so that you know what's going on. OK, these are, uh, and then uh, discussion on price. Oh, I see quite a few questions in chat. Let me see uh, what are the, okay. Okay. Okay, Dr. Mirza, okay, let me go back. Uh, we had that happen to over donation post. They thought we were scammers, glad. Okay, all right. First question, Dr. Mirza, what do you, suggest is a safe relative humidity for the greenhouse uh, as to where we, yeah. So generally for the plant to function better, humidity always go with the temperature. So if the temperature is 21, 22 degrees centigrade, then your safe humidity is in anywhere 60 to 75, even up to 80, there's no problem. All you need to be careful that when you drop your temperature from day to night, then the humidity should be more, should not be 90 plus. That's where the condensation will come and dew point will form. And you could easily check dew point on Google. You could plug in your numbers and they'll give you your dew point. So if the humidity is 95%, temperature is 18, then your dew point might be 16 degrees Celsius. So that this is the, you have to be very careful uh, with this aspect, you see. Okay, Dr. Mirza, what do you suggest? Okay, safe relative humidity. Uh, I think 40, 60% is a good target, Simon mentioned, and uh, preventing big humidity swings uh, is, uh, and preventing is helpful, yes. Yeah, 40% definitely not, Simon. Uh, uh, there are problems with that. When the plants start growing, they start contributing. So remember that, uh, Temperature and humidity, there's a terminology we use, vapor pressure deficit, VPD. Plants transpire water from root zone to the leaves based on that, what is the moisture content inside the leaf cell? And that depends on the temperature and humidity. If your humidity, if is 40%, temperature is 21, that's a very stressful situation for the plant. 60%, 21 degrees centigrade, you are in that reasonably good window. So up to 75%, you are safe. 80% is no problem, as long as at nighttime, uh, you don't, uh, uh, if the air is moving, no problem with 80% as well. Thanks, Simon, for, uh, okay. All right. Uh, how do you warm up uh, the water in such a large tank? Good question. Uh, most of the growers uh, have a inline heaters or a simple home heater. So by they, they don't warm it in a thousand liter tank. They warm it before it comes there. So you, yeah, difficult to warm in there. 
little bit of solar gain will happen. Uh, that's why we like those uh, tank to be black painted. But definitely try to put a heater in the incoming line so that when the water goes into the main tank, then the temperature is there. Okay, livestock watered heater is what we used last year. Okay, great point, Stephanie. There, livestock water heater is what we used last year. Perfect. I use a bucket heater from UFA. Works awesome. Bucket heater, uh, probably small quantities. Uh, I don't know large quantity inside the thousand liter, but th those are good suggestions uh, right here. Okay, now I will just quickly go through it and open up to people. That's a question people are asking me. And I said, look, you have to go with your production cost first to see, do you have any idea? Um, on the Greenos forum, uh, this discussion was going on. Uh, I think it was Tasha Bradshaw wrote that they are going to increase anywhere 10 to 20%. That's stimulated some discussion, very good point. Um, Justin uh, at Big Greenhouses mentioned that uh, uh, typically based on cost of goods sold, successful companies have this at around 30 to 38 to 40 percent. However, during times of rapid inflation, inflation, one must consider uh, your operating cost. In the northern area of this industry, we have large increases. Cost of natural gas up. 200 to 250%, plastic up 30 to 50%, plant material about 10%, general import insurance, delivery, fertilizer up 10 to 20%, basic electricity up 20%. So I think the, the, these are the things which uh, he pointed out. Uh, uh, then he say, I would assume this industry is ready for fairly large increases. Uh, on our products. However, one must consider the short and the medium term effects of loyalty, market participants, and market share. I would say box stores would be raising their prices about 10% this year, but who knows? Maybe they continue to pitch the wholesalers, try to maintain uh, last year pricing. So some very good points there. As for us, we think a steady increase in the pricing is not only fair to the consumer, but to the staff who get regular raises. Four to six percent is in the cards, but it all kind of depends upon financial strength of your business. As for uh, <laughs> southern neighbors, our cost to produce is significant. Higher than yours, we typically still live in igloos. So you are making some jokes there. And then our good friend Bill McCurry uh, wrote on uh, on this one that uh, uh, I don't know how many you know Bill or not. Uh, he comes here once in a while, very good uh, communicator, and also on these subjects. He says that your sales are how your customers vote for your bankruptcy or not. Too many retailers keep their prices so low that when they sell out of product, they didn't generate enough cash to continue operations. The customers bought the products they had, which showed support for the company. But the owners were too hesitant to change, to charge realistic prices. So the company painfully imploded. Price your goods so that you can generate the cash to rebuy new products at what will be higher price. I think there are very good uh, points here. And you have an obligation to your customers and employees and yourself to charge prices that allow you to continue operations. You remember the cranky customers from 1999 who said you charge too much while you forget the thousands of customers since then who appreciated your product your pricing and your place. Okay, I will stop sharing and now let's uh, continue on the subject of pricing. So who is uh, bold enough, brave enough to say that I'm raising by 10%? <laughs> yeah. 
Debbie, what is your situation? Um, we are raising some prices. So there's, there's more than one way to increase your margin. And uh, the obvious one is to raise prices, which we're doing in some aspects. Yeah. But uh, other way is to be more efficient with your space. So we have really been kind of zoning in on that, on that the last couple of years. And we're working harder on turning our bench space over more okay. and have things on the benches. So with that combination, we can, we can, um, I, I think we're doing great. I think we're doing great okay. with that combination. Okay. Yeah. I think good point that I always say to the vegetable growers that, uh, you have to increase your production per square meter to offset uh, some of these costs because vegetable growers are not direct retailers. Some of course, who go to the farmer's market. So I always say that uh, build your sensitivity curve, this simple table. If my production is 50 kilogram per square meter and my price is $1.50, this is where I stand. And very good economic studies have been done, but we plan to do some more this year or next year with all the rising cost. Uh, so what, what is the industry average? So uh, as, an, as an example, the good cucumber growers are hitting 200 cucumbers per square meter. And if you are getting 140 with the similar inputs, then there's something is not right. So you, you're not going to make it too long unless the greenhouse is paid off and your cost, uh, investment costs have been recovered. Tomatoes now, we are uh, gone at those days when uh, 40 kg per square meter was considered good. Now 60 kg per square meter or 60 pound per plant. Uh, I'm talking of the commercial crops now. Those are the ones which are standard, mini cucumbers, 70 kg per square meter per year. Your peppers, uh, they're close to 25 to 30 kilogram per square meter per year. Lettuce on hydroponic system, 14, 14 to 16 crops per year, 40 to 50 kilogram weight you, you could generate. So you have to look at your own situation that uh, Debbie's approach is one, direct raise cost, but have some idea that uh, what, what are your operating costs and what are your investment costs? You have to pay your staff as well, how much your labor is there. I could always share our 19, uh, sorry, 2017 study. If you want it, drop me an email. Uh, in the, at least you'll compare that, what's your investment cost in the industry? What are the operating costs? What is the gross revenue? So that will be helpful as well. Sandra, what's going on in your part of the woods? Uh, <laughs> frozen plugs, late shipping. Um, yeah, it's just the weather's been good here, so that's a bonus. But it's just very disappointing when you open up 17 boxes of plants and three of them are frost damaged. Really? Like, it's, yeah. It, yeah. It's strong. Yeah, it's been. Not fun. Are you going to raise fuel prices on top 10 plants? Yeah. Yes. So hanging baskets, I'm going to go up $2. And the four and a half inch square hard pots and the four and a half inch deep greens, they have doubled the case. They've gone up over $60 a case. So I, I don't have a choice. I'm going up at least a dollar per pot on those ones because they're the most popular size like for um most of your grasses and um things like dichondras and tuberous begonias all that kind of stuff so i think it's logical that we do i can't see how growers can keep keeping their prices low low like that they're not making any money like you're just right. not right 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 Shirley how you are going to handle the pricing uh, this year well I thought I had a handle on it until um January when the uh, electricity cost doubled uh, for our <laughs> home 
So uh, I'm kind of revisiting that now. So it's funny that this is coming up because I'm really interested to hear what other people are doing. Um, uh, so I think I'll probably end up doing a, a slight combination of what Debbie's doing. Um, mm-hmm. So we've gone to like the three and a half inch pots so we can have more pots on the bench. And I tried to stagger my orders of, of the plant material so that I would, you know, hopefully the theory was and if I've done it correctly, I don't know, it's first time trying that, um, but hopefully to have sort of those, you know, the replenishment ready um, by the time the first lot sells. But I really do think, um, you know, we sell, and I wasn't going to change my um, my price. We sold mostly at 425 and then for some selects, um, uh, we sold them at 450 uh, per pot. So being on a three and a half inch pot, I'm not changing my prices on those, right, but right, again, right. I'm, 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 I haven't reached a final decision on it yet, but I do think some things are going to have to go up. Right. Right. Yeah. Great. Was there a lot of water feed? What's your, what is your take on uh, pricing? Um, I'm, raising the prices on um, all my four inch. I'm leaving my six inch the same price um, just because I know what the box stores around me are charging. Okay. Okay. And the six packs are all going up as well. And how about baskets? You know, they probably should. But I have a fundraiser that I do every year, and right. they set their prices way back in January. So I'm I'm gonna leave them the way they are for this year because I don't want um, customers coming into the greenhouse and saying, "Oh, well, I could have got it through the fundraiser for." five dollars less you know so um i've talked to the fundraiser groups and told them that the their price is going to go up next year but for this year the hanging baskets will stay the same i'm still i still have a fairly decent margin on them but okay okay yeah hey laura um yeah yeah it's deb um last year we moved all our six packs from a 606 to an 606 to an 806 oh yeah yeah, it saved us, well, not quite 30%, but um, we, it saved me a lot of bench space. And yeah. if any customers mentioned it or noticed, no one mentioned it. I had grown in the 806s or 608s, however you say it, um, one year, a few years back. And I just found that my staff had a really hard time keeping them watered well enough when it was hot. So that's why I went back to the 606s, just because they hold a little more soil and a little more moisture. But they definitely, yeah, definitely take up less space. Yeah, it's, uh, it, they, they do dry out faster. So we bumped, we bumped the dates back for the plants that go in them. Oh yeah, yeah. Back about two so weeks. They're a bit and smaller, yeah. They're a little smaller, yeah. 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 So that's just one of the things that we we did to be a little more efficient with our space. And uh, yeah. I, I this year I have to try and figure out how to get one extra planting in in the same amount of space. <laughs> Quite figured out that how I, where I'm going to put everything yet. But anyway. We, we always make it work, right? <laughs> <laughs> Some nice conversation on the chat going on. So have a look at that one as well. And let me go to randomly. Michelle, how is in the north? Uh, what's your situation with the prices this year? Um, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, um, yeah. I increased, so we do a fundraiser, but it was set in February. So I did increase our hanging basket prices, probably about five, 4%, which isn't too much more than inflation. Right. Well, it's less than inflation this year. Right. And yeah, just trying to be more efficient in the greenhouse and fit more in. 
yeah, yeah. That, that's a very good point. You know that cut down your wastage at the end. Uh, you don't have to go on sales. Uh, so try to, I mean, keep them green. Uh, as most of the time when plants are mature, uh, many people will stop feeding them. So I always recommend that maintain the color on them. Cut down your feeding. Cut down your losses uh, in the from diseases as well. Space utilization efficiently. Uh, vegetables are pretty stable sector. This year has expanded your tomatoes, cucumbers, and once the fruit is hanging on them, you really could get a few dollars more on them because the reward is immediate. You know that uh, here I go and pick up ready to eat uh, tomatoes and cucumbers and peppers and uh, I have I know some bedding plant growers have a small four by eight uh, hydroponic floating hydroponic unit which you could build for six hundred dollars and uh, people come for that as well so yeah th there are different options there as well let's see loretta has commented already in the chat box beth fulton uh, how are you doing eco glenn hey dr marissa um I raise my prices just about every year, whether it's 25 cents or 50 cents. Okay. Just, um, slow increases, and then it doesn't take the customer by surprise. Um, we also flipped to three and a half inch pots this year instead of four inch and four and a half, just more plants per bench. Um, we're already turning over quite a bit of product with the way we grow. So. Mm. Right. And then just really watching the temperatures and trying to be as efficient as we can. So yeah. not leaving doors open with young kids going in and out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's a training experience with 15 year olds who don't know to close the door, but <laughs> um, they learn. So yeah, just doing everything we can to bring people in and just Keep our head above water. <laughs> good, good. How did those geraniums fare? Did they are turning around good? Um, they're well. They're sitting there right now, so they're. I've lost a few more, maybe ones I hadn't cleaned enough. Right. Um, and they're separated from everything else, just so that we can avoid cross contamination and reduce potential further waste. Right. And. Otherwise, there's, they've got one and two leaves on them, so we'll see. I did yeah, find replacement yes. crops, so I'm yeah, not. Still, yeah, still some time for them to come along, yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah, so. And uh, let's go to Vanessa. You have been pretty quiet. What's going on? Uh, well, I'm only in my second year, and we... <laughs> uh, what did we, we went from 2000 square feet to almost 6,000 square feet. So I'm a little terrified to see the first gas bill. Um, I ended up having to put the second greenhouse on a week and a half early because I had the wrong date for a shipment, a big oh. shipment that was coming in. So I had to throw the second one on. So I'm still in the terrified mode <laughs> and I'm kind of uh, just watching all the experts out there uh, with what they're doing and their prices and hoping that uh, we are not royally up the creek. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, <clears throat> our prices were uh, similar to those that were around us uh, in White Court within like a two hour radius. I kind of uh, went through anything I could find online for people's prices and um, we kind of matched that. Um, a little worried about hanging baskets prices <laughs> and just the bigger items and just, some new stuff that we have just yeah, yeah. really tried to stick to the three and a half inch pots, but then I know some things they just need the space to grow uh, larger. So just trying to do that. And I used a lot of spray foam this year to try and seal any holes. And, <laughs> and uh, we don't, our kids don't really go to the greenhouse, so they haven't learned to open any doors yet. So <laughs> um, on, on those uh, new structures, new area, how is your mice population? Are they coming in or you are trapping them pretty good? Uh, we like mice as in the rodent. Yeah, yeah. Um, we don't have any that I'm aware of in the new okay. building. 
Uh, I think there might be one in the, the 2000 square foot greenhouse because I randomly hear things. Nice. So <laughs> there's there might be a few, but we were careful to try and keep all food like you know household food out of there yeah. um girls would eat outside the greenhouse and we just got rid of as much garbage as possible but as i am sure they're there i just yeah. uh, hope i don't see them because i might be on the bench with the flowers <laughs> <laughs> because i noticed a cat in laura's background there so <laughs> you could know the cat from her you see, so. <laughs> yeah no our kitty cat doesn't go outside out of the house she doesn't like the snow and we have a lot of snow today so <laughs> right, right, right no we're just we have uh, a few extras if you can catch them you can take them home oh i'm, I'm good i don't like cats. <laughs> i'm more worried they're gonna rip the plastic inside the greenhouse um no we're, we're i have just... a not so funny story so we have a 10 month old mastiff mm -hmm. and a cat managed a wild cat managed to find its way into the back greenhouse while somebody was you know left the door open a crack right and um of course he found it mm -hmm. and he come flying down the aisle after this cat wiped out on the wet <laughs> landscape fabric and just about took the door off the hinges <laughs> it's like oh my gosh animals out <laughs> yeah right yeah animals and kids <laughs> <laughs> i see brenda here brenda perversoff how are you doing hi dr mirza how are you doing good thanks and you it's we are enjoying your uh chat again ray yeah, joined right. us yeah. <laughs> this night but but yeah we're similar to what other people are saying um we try and raise prices and some things a bit every year and we um we'll probably be doing that this year i haven't got to all of that yet um some of the is um sizing of containers we've grown in 806s for quite a few years and we do a lot of three and a half inch stuff too mm -hmm. so yeah we'll be doing pricing but pricing changes but i'm not quite there yet right right, right. You still grow and some tree, tree seedling as well? We're not this year, oh, okay. um, but um, we'll have some again next year. Okay, okay. But yeah, we do some a lot of cabbage and um, well, this year it'll be broccoli seedlings for a grower down south. So. Oh really? Okay, okay. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's filling yeah. the space. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Anyways, Dr. Mirza, we do enjoy the chats. Good. 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 Who else I leave behind? Uh, Marjorie, how are you doing? We're doing good. Um, the weather has been a little bit nicer. Yeah. Um, we were very worried when we weren't getting some plants on time and, and worried about them. Then we heard they drove around in an unheated truck for two hours. So we were really worried, but actually they, they were really quite good. And we have also gone to, from the 606 to 806, this is the first year that we've done that. Yeah. Uh, we're not totally sold on that because like the other ladies were saying that you gotta be more diligent in the watering. Right, right. You gotta really watch them. And I, we're just waiting to see what how they perform. Like, I'm not sure that they're going to be as good in the, 806s as they will in the 606s. So that's what's happening in our end of the world. Good, 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 great. I know Pine Meadow has a couple of questions. Uh, so are you ready to ask them? Yes. Uh, Dr. Mirza, going back to uh, fertilizers right. in the greenhouse, why uh, my calcium pump is off? for a couple of days now. And my leech, when I check the EC in the leech, it's still up above four. Okay. Yeah, so your, your, uh, your injector, if, the, if, if, the, if they're not equal amount to sucking from your NPK and calcium, then this means something is wrong with the injector. Uh, EC four, I'm not worried at this time. Uh, the, the, the light is still low, there's no problem. But to check out that why, is it possible that some sediment has settled down in calcium nitrate tank? 
No, well, I, I got it mixed in a five gallon pail. Yeah, I got right. two pumps. I got two pumps. One pump is pulling up the five, six, 20. Yeah. yeah. Five, six, 27. The other one is uh, pump is pulling calcium. It's feeding yeah. calcium. Yeah. And uh, I have to switch the calcium pump off now and then to keep the EC from going up above four or five. You know, is that is that normal? Yeah, we could always cut it down. Your ratio is, uh, what is your feed EC, fertilizer going in? What's the EC on that? The fertilizer going in with the kelp pump off is uh, about 1.7 to 1.75 to 1.8. But how about with the calcium pump on? The calcium pump is 2.70. I keep it around there. Yeah. So if you're feeding that and leach is four, then uh, uh, yeah, we should not stop the calcium pump. Find out the reason why it's not sucking. If there's no precipitate sitting under under there, then there's something wrong with the injector. That is not. It should be in equal amounts. Uh, yeah. I'm not worried with that kind of EC. How are the plants doing generally? The plants look all right. The plants look good. Yeah. But there's nothing wrong with the pump because I can switch the pump back on. It will pull calcium, like it will feed calcium back yeah, in. Yeah, no, yeah, don't, 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 don't stop it. Uh, we just have to uh, introduce a little bit of plain water. So two feeding with the. Yeah, don't try to bring the EC down with the fertile solution. Uh, introduce uh, one or two watering pure plain water uh, once daily, once or twice daily to bring the EC down. Mm -hmm. But EC, EC4 at this time of the year is not any any danger to the plants. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, why, I uh, got a question. Why is the EC at four when it's only feeding in uh, at uh, two point, just under three? Yeah, most of the time what happens is that plants are very smart. If they, If the humidity is low in the greenhouse, then they are interested to absorb more water and leave the fertilizer in, in the bags. So they, they are smart, they could do that. So mm -hmm. what happened is your humidity is low, vapor, pre vapor pressure deficit is high. So plant needs more water to cool itself. So it will mm -hmm. stop whenever the EC goes higher, then that's what you what you suspect that uh, your, your relative humidity is low in the greenhouse. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, I could just uh, introduce water during the day because right now I got my timer set. It's feeding 12 times a day at eight minutes yeah. each time. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you, you could always introduce uh, during the noon time a couple of plain watering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, okay. Well, that's what I had. The questions I had, Dr. Mirza. Okay, great, great. I'm glad some vegetable growers have joined in. Uh, yeah. Levi, how yeah. are you doing? Levi, are you there? Yes, I am. I just said this morning, this is my busiest week in, uh, in uh, <laughs> all the year. Okay. It's uh, busy planting and uh, just uh, we're just getting our plants this week. Okay. I okay. know a lot of growers have gotten theirs already. But from Central Botanical, we have got a shipment just for hanging baskets. Okay. okay. <clears throat> and uh, with the prices, I agree with everybody. And we just have to uh, keep with the flow. I mean, if we want to continue in our industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's great. All right. Any more questions? Uh, are we in a good shape? Good time? 8.40? So if no more questions, then we'll wind up and we'll be seeing you on uh, April. Uh, I still use my old calendar. April 11th. Yeah, okay, well, uh, I'll send you the recording as well so that uh, Okay, question. What did you say? Nighttime relative humidity and temperature should be again. Um, nighttime should be cooler than the daytime. Most of the bedding plants are around 17, 18 degrees Celsius. Uh, humidity at nighttime normally will rise uh, 
because plants are producing uh, more moisture at night time. So try to maintain, first thing is more important, that humidity is from when you're switching from daytime to nighttime, make sure that uh, when your night temperature goes in, your humidity is not over 80%. So, and then nighttime, uh, if you have a dehumidification system, then set your dehumidity fan at around 85%. And then same thing apply in the morning, your day temperature should coincide when the sun is fully rise. So to sunrise, you should be at that temperature. So slowly bring that, uh, get rid of the humidity. How many of you have got a dehumidification fan in the greenhouses? Raise your hand. None? Sandra, you have? Any dehumidification fan? I use the humidification, dehumidification with my Bartlett. Okay. So it's hooked up so that the inlet shutter opens, then the furnace runs, then the inlet shutter opens again, and like it does the cycle. So that's how we, that's how I dehumidify. I've got the computer set for a certain percentage, which was 80. I think I asked you about that last year because yeah, yeah. I just had got my building. Yeah. And it works really well, so. Who else has got uh, any dehumidification at nighttime? Yeah, well, I think we, we should look at that. There are some simple things which you could do to dehumidify. Uh, and this way your diseases are not an issue. I have circulation fans that run all night. Yeah, circulation fans are helpful, but if the humidity inside, because you're not able to exchange your cold, dry air. So normally you might have seen that right in the middle, there is a fan and then there's a tube there. You know, that, that tube is on a dehumidification system. So whenever cold air will come in, get mixed and then expel the uh, warm, humid air outside. Yeah, I have though I have those running during the day, but not at night. Yeah, so you should run them at night time as well, just to be cautious with the. Uh, with they the only kick in when they get to a certain like they're on a thermostat. Okay. So they kick in when they need to, but they they never kick in at night, as far as yeah, I know. So because anyway. they are on a thermostat, not on a heat yeah. Normally, some very small fans, six inches fans were available, which you install close to your exhaust fan, and they are set on humidity. So they mm -hmm. are such a small fan, they are exhaust fan, but small one. So they only suck the humidity, don't let any cold air in. So oh. to check with the, those are the dehumidification fans. I, I know my humidity because I've got the sensors in there. My humidity at night is about 47 percent that's okay yeah at this time because your plants are not big enough so 47 percent is not bad at night time but slowly as your plants get bigger then you will have yeah. high humidity yeah. Yeah. yeah question from stephanie sandra is your system from bartlett climate boss yes yes it is Okay. I have a, a climate boss and I also have the weather alarm system for it. Okay. All right, uh, everybody. Thank you very much. Take care, stay healthy and uh, see you in a couple of weeks.